Um, the, the webinar is being hosted by the Mandela Institute, which is part of the University of Advertisement. Uh, let me talk about the program before we start. Uh, the director of the Mandela Institute, uh, Professor Philos Kuchelia, uh, and thereafter, uh, our three speakers, uh, who I will introduce once, once, once we get to them, they'll be speaking. Uh, it's Adil Patel uh, from, from Cliff Decker, Advocate Vango Neoko, and Advocate Steve Badlander. Uh, thereafter, we'll have a facilitated discussion and uh, questions from, from the audience. So, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, and uh, without much ado, I'd like to give it to uh, Professor Rose Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. Um, I'd like to, to welcome everyone uh, to this webinar to discuss a fascinating uh, subject, one that has uh, emerged uh, uh, with some importance uh, in jurisdictions uh, across the world in uh, over the last few months. Um, I suppose there are three interrelated questions which uh, will be addressed by our interlocutors today. The first uh, is, is whether the state should, and if it does, impose a, a mandatory requirement. And let me make it even more interesting, perhaps, if it does so based on expert scientific evidence impose a mandatory requirement uh, to take the vaccine, whether such um, a, a, a decision by the, the state, by our public authorities, would survive constitutional scrutiny. Uh, the second is, is whether private actors um, like employers um, who take such action in the absence of state action, whether such a mandatory requirement imposed by a private actor would raise legal questions, perhaps of employment law and even perhaps of uh, some of constitutional import. Cutting across, I think, both issues um, is the question whether the imposition of such a mandatory requirement in the context of a pandemic um, raises constrains a constitutionally protected right in the first place. I think that is a question that uh, we will listen to with some interest today. And then if it does, whether, uh, whether such a constraint um, will survive constitutional scrutiny under the justification provisions of the Constitution. These are extremely important uh, questions which explains perhaps why there's such interest uh, uh, in this uh, particular webinar. Um, I'm certainly looking forward to the contributions uh, of Advocate Budlander, um, Advocate Muvangua, uh, and Mr. Patel of Cliff Decker Hofmeyer um, on, on the subjects before us today. Um, I'd like to, to thank Ali for, for his initiative uh, in this regard, and I'm now going to hand over uh, to him. Thank you very much. I look forward to the conversation. Ali, are you muted? I am muted. I'm going to come back now. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, <coughs> thank you for the welcome and feels. I think uh, I think maybe once we stop talking, maybe maybe we should switch off our cameras and uh, mics. And uh, okay, thank you. <coughs> 
Uh, thank, thank you for the for the warm welcome, and I'd like to thank Feroz for giving us the Professor Kutela for giving us the platform uh, to to do this webinar. Um, I'm just going to introduce the three speakers. I'm going to introduce all three of them at once so that we have a flow to the conversation. Uh, the first speaker we're going to have to talk to us today is Adil uh, Patel. Um, he's a national head, uh, national practice head, uh, director of Cliff Decker, and uh, he's a thought leader in the field. He's recognized for his in-depth expertise in employment law and has acted extensively for various employees in the public and the private sector. He's worked with multiple jurisdictions in Africa and globally. Uh, he's presented in a wide array of legal topics with different audiences. He's recognized by his peers and his clients for his proficiency in employment law. Uh, his track records includes having success successfully advised and represented a number of state-owned entities, as well as companies listed on the JSE. Sectors administrative and public, evasion, mining, mundo, employee benefits. Uh, he's involved in quite a bit of uh, a bit of these issues, uh, protection and privacy, outsourcing, corporate investigations. Uh, and that's Adil Patel who will be our first speaker. But as I said, I'm going to introduce all three speakers so that we have a flow to the conversation. Our second speaker is Advocate Nayaku Muvangua, uh, who, I, uh, who is who is. Uh, has quite a number of qualifications, um, in addition to being an advocate at the, at the bar. Uh, she's got an uh, LLB uh, from UCT, a BA Economics from Smith College, a PhD from UCT, uh, PG Dub from um, Tax Law. Um, uh, before joining the bar, uh, she has uh, worked as a law research clerk to former Chief Justice in Corbo, and for Justice Fronman Zondo at the Constitutional Court. In 2012, she also worked as a research at the Center for Applied Legal Studies. So she's got a wealth of experience and uh, currently working at currently at the bar. And uh, and I know how busy she is, and I appreciate her taking the time uh, to come and speak to us. Uh, the final speaker will be uh, uh, a close friend of uh, of, of, of Wits Law School, uh, Advocate Steve Budlander, who's a member of Pabasa uh, Sentence Chambers. Uh, uh, he has extensive practice, often dealing with high-profile novel matters. Uh, his expertise in constitutional law, um, administrative law, regulatory law, media law. More, they appeared in more than 70 cases in the Constitutional Court, more than 40 cases in the SCA. He's also an acting judge in the Johannesburg High Court. And, uh, and uh, I also know he's extremely busy. All three of these uh, speakers are extremely busy. and. Uh, but I think it's an important conversation uh, that we're going to have today, and uh, gives me great pleasure to to welcome our guests. guest. Um, with the first call, uh, Adil Patel. Thank you, Adil. Thank you, uh, Dr. Chikte. It is fascinating to talk about this topic uh, through the through Wits University and the Nelson Mandela Institute, and. Uh, our firm and myself are eternally grateful uh, for the opportunity. As attorneys and counsel, when dealing with this topic, we attempt to advise our respective clients within the four corners of the regulations and the law as they exist and the the regulations as they exist are the consolidated directions uh, issued under the Occupational Health and Safety Act. And that has a voluntary element to it regarding uh, vaccination. So one undertakes a risk assessment and you need to consider whether you wish to introduce uh, vaccines, make it mandatory in the workplace and Annexure C then of the regulations sets out some guidelines. Uh, you as the employer then are required to look at uh, the applications. If anyone wishes to make an apply for an exemption on both constitutional and medical grounds, and uh, there is an element where you need to reasonably accommodate uh, employees. If the exemption is available, 
What it doesn't do is that if people refuse to then uh, take the vaccine, having made it mandatory, what are your rights? It doesn't talk about how do you introduce a mandatory vaccination policy where your policies are part of terms and conditions uh, of employment. Uh, it doesn't talk about your liability and the like. And the question that we need to start asking ourselves is, given this global pandemic, is it the responsibility of employers solely to be keeping the workplace safe? Are we not placing too much of a burden on employers? And you may frown at my statement and say, well, if it's not the employer's responsibility, who else? But consider this for a moment. Our unemployment rate uh, in terms of the QLF uh, report is at 34.4% Q2 in 2021. So what you have in South Africa is a group of unemployed people and a group of employed people. And the law has created a framework for the safekeeping of the employed. And the unemployed are left to be vaccinated through incentives. So the question is that are we not further dividing our group of employed and unemployed individuals within South Africa? So that's the first question that we need to ask ourselves. When we have a global pandemic, is it correct that we have this divide? But the second thing is, given the fact that it's a global pandemic, are we not placing too much of an administrative burden on the employer when dealing with this? So the first thing that we're asking employers to do is to decide whether they wish to introduce a mandatory vaccination. Having so decided, the employer now needs to determine how is it going to implement it? Well, if it has a trade union, uh, the regulations intimate that you could have a collective agreement. So it needs to go into negotiations. So it needs to take working time and sit and negotiate with a trade union on a mandatory vaccination policy. If it reaches deadlock with the trade union, there's a potential that there may be industrial action. If it doesn't have a trade union and it opts to unilaterally implement a mandatory vaccination policy, these are its further issues. So it sits now and has to determine as an employer whether an exemption is justifiable on a constitutional or a medical ground. So it needs to employ individuals or contract with service providers to assist it, thereby increasing its cost. It then must find reasonable accommodation for those employees who refuse or who are exempted. And if it is unable to find reasonable accommodation, it must then embark on some sort of termination proceedings. Whether it be incapacity, operational requirements, misconduct and the like. 
The CCMA in this week had indicated that they had started red flagging employees who have been dismissed as a result of them uh, not having taken the vaccine. The employers are now going to have to defend their decisions as a result of that. They're going to have to go to the CCMA or to the Labour Court and say, in order to create a safe working environment, in order to create a safe working environment, I've introduced a mandatory vaccination policy. Employees refuse to accept it or refuse to take it. I can't accommodate them, I've terminated them. But the fact is that employees are now needing to justify the introduction of their policy, justify why they have not granted an exemption, and then justify the ultimate dismissal. And the question that we need to ask ourselves is, is somebody else not better placed to take over this administrative burden. The law reports are going to be uh, flooded with cases from an employment law perspective regarding this. Internationally, we have seen, internationally, we have seen the amount, the number of disputes that have been lodged against employers who have sought to introduce mandatory vaccination because all the legislature has done is that it hasn't allowed you to introduce a mandatory vaccination policy. Your right was always there. It simply brought it to the forefront. It hasn't created it hasn't created further protection for you as an employer when all you wish to do is introduce a safe working environment given the global pandemic. And when you wish to create the safe working environment, you as an employer whose core business is something other than evaluating exemptions, needs to now defend you, the introduction of your policy, defend your decision on whether somebody needs to be exempted, potentially have a dismissal red flag by the CCMA, and then incur the time and expense to defend your decision when there is really no guidance out there. And the question that you need to ask yourself is, should the framework be somebody other than employers? This discussion and debate today is not about whether vaccinations are the right thing. It's not about whether you are able to access somebody's information. Whether what are the exemptions and how do you justify it as an employer? The question that we need to start asking ourselves, because there have been many webinars and a host of academic writings on the introduction of a mandatory vaccination, on the implications of the Protection of Personal Information Act, on what are religious, medical, and the right to dignity exemptions. The question that we need to start asking ourselves is that the obligation to introduce a mandatory vaccination policy, is it correct to place that burden on employers, both the public and the private sector? Or should it be the state or other role players? 
I leave you with that question and we will return to it after Advocate Butlander's uh, presentation for 10 minutes where we can then engage with you and hopefully come up with a solution as to whether or come up, to an, come up with an answer as to whether the employer is the correct vehicle to ensure that our country is vaccinated. Thank you. And I'll give you over to Edric in New York. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Good evening. So I will invite... You can start. You oh, can start, okay. yeah. Thank you. Thanks. I was invited to address you on the question of whether man mandatory vaccinations violate, the language used was one of violate constitutional rights. And I want to, at the outset, distinguish between the concept of violating a right and that of limiting a right. Violation of a right is conduct that, in effect, takes away that right from somebody. And what I believe conversation for tonight ought to focus on is not so much a violation of the right, but a limitation of those rights. Now, having for granted that is the there are three, as I see it, uh, three could be more depending on, on, on one's life experiences and belief system. But there are three rights that are implicated by mandatory vaccinations, three constitutional rights. And the first is the right to bodily integrity and security of, of, of a person in that body. The second is one's freedom of um, opinion, religion, and so on. And the third is a, li it is a right to, to life. And I must say at the outset that the right to, to, to bodily integrity has been held by the Constitutional Court to include two further rights, and that's the right to privacy as well as the right to dignity. <coughs> so this is why I say there could be more rights implicated depending on, on one's outlook and life experiences and the facts presented typically before a court. Now, the question then, one pr proceeds from the premise that mandatory vaccinations could impose limitations on, on rights. And what the focus ought to be is whether those limitations are justifiable in the kind of democratic order that South Africa espouses. The idea of, justi of, of justifying a, a limitation on the right is really um, undergirded by the notion of a social contract. And in South Africa, we often use the word Ubuntu, the notion of Ubuntu, because what that means is my being as an individual is not absolute. It is determined and dependable upon the existence of another. I am because you are. So the social contract in otherwise you know, regular parlance recognizes that very idea that there is an interdependence between individuals. So this is why we talk about a justifiability of a limitation. Um, now, in terms of the Constitution, where conduct is limiting of one's rights, especially the rights in the Bill of Rights, the first question that the Constitution asks is whether there is a law of general application. In other words, is the instrument that is limiting that right, one that is generally uh, of application. And the Constitutional Court has had that, held that uh, a contract is not a law of, of general application, so it could never be held as such. So that's the first premise that one has to interrogate, is to ask the question whether there is an instrument that applies generally and that um, could, could be rendered a justification for the limitation of a right. But that's not enough. 
That's not enough um, because there are other considerations, even though there is a law of general application. Um, Mr. Patel spoke earlier of the directions issued under the Occupational Health and Safety Act. Um, that alone is not enough to get one home and drive. There are further considerations that ought to be taken into account. The Constitution requires factors such as the, the nature of the right that is being limited to be taken into consideration. So in my example of the three rights, one would have to consider, well, what is the nature of the right to bodily integrity? What is the nature of the right to freedom of religion? And what is the nature of the right to life? The right to life has been held by the courts to be absolute because without it, one cannot enjoy the rights that are contained in the Bill of Rights. So that's the first order of considerations. And this is not a closed list. The second order of considerations that one must take into account is the purpose or the reason for limiting the right. What does that mean? Why should my right to freedom of religion or freedom of bodily integrity be limited by the, the mandatory vaccination? Well, as I understand the science, and I'm no scientist, is that is in order to protect. So you limit my right to protect yours as well as mine. So there's a secularism about it. And that's where the idea of Ubuntu comes into play here. The third order of considerations that one might, what would need to take into account is the extent or nature. And this is why there is a difference between a violation of a right, which effectively is an annihilation thereof, um, and a limitation of that right. Because the third consideration um, is what is the extent of the limitation if the mandatory vaccination takes away completely my right to freedom of or to, to bodily freedom of religion or freedom to bodily integrity, then a different conversation needs to be had. Um, and you know, so that's the third order of, of, of factors that one must take into account. And then importantly, though, one would have to take into consideration whether there are other alternatives available to achieve the purpose, um, which is in this instance to save lives and perhaps grow the economy, to achieve that purpose, but without encroaching, which is limiting on one's rights in the Bill of Rights. Well, whether or not those alternatives are available would be determined um, on a on a fact by fact on a case by case basis. What does that mean? Um, it matters. So, for example, I mean, of the, because of the nature of COVID-19, it has been said, or the science says, well, people outside in ventilated areas and so on, that's safer. Most environments are safer than in closed environments. And something might need to be said about an employee who does not come into contact with anybody else who works outside alone, for example. Um, and the question then becomes, well, is it necessary to compel them to be vaccinated in those circumstances? I have no answer to this question. It's just a postulation of an example. But the bigger question what I have, though, is whether a vaccination mandate ought to be as blanket or as black and white. You're either vaccinated or you're not, without new ones, without providing for exemptions, um, without considering other avenues that one could use to give effect to the purpose for which the limitation is sought. Um, so that's just to foreground perhaps where conversation might go in due time. Um, but I must also say that in as far as laws of general application are concerned, I search and I'm not aware of any law of general application um, that applies universally to any set of relationship barring the employee-employer relationship which exists in the context of labor law. So an argument could be made as well that currently and beyond that scope, there is actually no law of general application um, in the country. And perhaps you know, it could be an invitation or a moment for the state to step in and promulgate that law of general application beyond the employee-employer the employer environment and, and legislate more broadly. But I leave that to Stephen Butlender for now.
Thanks very much, Nyoko. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. And uh, it's, it's a great pleasure to be here. And uh, th thank you very much. Uh, Ali described me as a friend of Vitz. I think what he just means is I'm a former student of Vitz and a, and a proud Vitzy, so it's, it's very nice to be here. I have been asked to speak about the third leg of this debate. And the third leg is, is there a duty uh, on the government to enact legislation or regulations to provide specifically for mandatory vaccination? And I want to address three topics. The first is where the duty on the state might come from. The second is why it is not good enough or may not be good enough to rely on the Occupational Health and Safety Act. And the third is how would it be done? And I'd like to address each of those in turn. But before I do so, I think it's important to set out expressly what the uh, premises of my assessment are, because there are at least three. The first is that we must assume uh, that COVID-19 is not disappearing as a, as a potentially fatal illness anytime soon. Sitting as we are now with relatively low cases, it's, 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 it's hard to imagine we could be back in a fourth wave, but of course we all know that, that the opposite is true. The second is that we must assume because that, as I understand it, is what the science tells us, is that the vaccines are an effective way of preventing people from suffering serious illness and death as a consequence of COVID-19. But the third and perhaps critical element is that the vaccines are also an effective way of reducing the spread of COVID-19. In other words, uh, they, they reduce the odds that we will transmit COVID-19 to each other. And that's an important piece of the puzzle, because if that were not true, if the vaccines were only about, if I take a vaccine and that is only about whether I will get ill, the argument for mandatory vaccine goes down. Whereas if I take a vaccine and it prevents me or reduces the odds of me spreading the disease to others or spreading a, a severe form of the disease, then the argument for a mandatory vaccine uh, process goes up. So against that backdrop, and I will assume those three premises, let's deal with the three questions. And the first is, where would this duty to come from? And the answer is that the duty would come from Section 7.2 of the Constitution, because Section 7.2 of the Constitution says that the state must respect, protect, promote, and fulfill the rights in the Bill of Rights. And the Constitutional Court has explained what that has meant. It means, it did so in the Glenister 2 case, in a different context about corruption, but it explained that what 7.2 means is not just that the state must refrain from violating our rights, but that the state must sometimes take positive measures to protect our rights. So in that context, the Glenister 2 context, what the court held was that there was a constitutional duty on the state to create an effective and independent uh, corruption fighting unit. Uh, as, an, as part of combating corruption because of the dangers that corruption caused to the rights in the Bill of Rights. Now, if that is so, it seems to me arguably that there's a similar duty on the state to create legislation that enables vaccines to be broadly distributed and requires people, subject to certain exceptions perhaps, to take the vaccines. So it seems to me that 7.2 likely gives rise to the kind of duty that we could do, be, that, that would arise, because we know that COVID-19 threatens our lives, it threatens our bodily integrity and freedom and security of the person, it threatens our right to healthcare because of the extraordinary and unprecedented strain it places on healthcare services. And so in, given that all of those are fundamental rights, and if you accept my premise, the premises I articulated, that vaccines are an effective way of preventing people from suffering serious illness and are an effective way of reducing the spread, it seems to me arguable that mandatory vaccine legislation or regulations uh, is a incident of the state's duty to take reasonable measures under Section 7.2 of the Constitution. But that, of course, all begs the question, which is why do we not simply rely on the OHSA? Why is it that one needs special purpose-built legislation instead of relying, as some companies have done, on the Occupational Health and Safety Act? And I accept for purposes of argument that, uh, and I think it's, it's more than argument, I think it's likely that you can introduce a mandatory vaccine policy under the OHSA, subject to certain constraints and exceptions and so on. And that's not the purpose of this address. But it seems to me that there are problems with that, because what we are doing when we rely on the OHSA is we are really forcing a square peg into a round hole. 
The provisions of the OHSA are not specifically geared to vaccines. They therefore are not specifically geared to considering what exemptions, if any, should be in place for vaccines. And they do not set up appropriate mechanisms to assist people in determining whether people should be exempted from the duty to take vaccines. And so the advantage of a purpose-built set of regulations or a purpose-built uh, piece of legislation uh, is obvious. It seems to me there are at least four. Firstly, consistency. It does seem very odd that the question of whether you are required to take a vaccine or, or, or receive a vaccine depends on which employer you work for. Why should it depend on whether you work for one medical aid or another, or one law firm or another? Why, why should it be the case that it depends on that? So consistency is a reason. The second reason is certainty, because as uh, Ardil has already highlighted, there is considerable uncertainty about what is lawful and what is not, and what is required of employers and what is not in relation to vaccines. A piece of legislation with checks and balances built in would, would, would assist that. The third reason is constitutionality, because as Nyoko points out, uh, it's very important in the constitutional assessment that there is a law of general application to limit the rights concerned. Now, of course, the OHSA is a law of general application, but there will be arguments for sure about whether it is a sufficiently um, specific law of general application or whether, in fact, there needs to be more specific limitations of rights if the limitation of rights is to be uh, permissible. The fourth reason is that there might be a basis for saying that a government law would relieve the administrative burden. That is Ardil's point, although one cannot assume that, of course, because government could pass a law which said we're not going to determine who should get it, but we are going to lay out with, for, certain, for the sake of certainty uh, what sort of exemptions there are, how it works, who you exempt, etc. But the fifth and last reason is that it seems to me that to think that this is a matter for employees and employers only is a mistake. COVID self-evidently does not only spread in employment contexts, it spreads in any context in which there are many people. And it is a mistake, I think, to see this as being an employer or employment issue only. If we are serious about, about achieving herd immunity and widespread vaccine take up, it may well be necessary to say we are going to legislate across all contexts. So it would apply to schools, it would apply to workplaces, it would apply to government buildings, it would apply to a whole range of different contexts. And it may and that would be the most effective way of achieving uh, the vaccine take-up and the herd immunity. And so all of those reasons seem to me to suggest that there is much to be said for a tailor-made piece of legislation or, piece of reg or set of regulations uh, dealing with this issue. That leaves only one question, which is, assuming I'm right and assuming that there is a duty, how would it be done? And there are two ways it could be done. The first would be a bespoke piece of legislation, the COVID Vaccine Act, which required uh, vaccines to be administered or required employers to uh, insist that the employees are administered or schools and so on. The trouble with that, of course, is legislation takes a long time, although we did see with the COVID tax relief that legislation was passed quite quickly um, in relation to COVID. But the other alternative is Section 27.2N of the Disaster Management Act, 57 of 2002. As we well know, COVID has been declared a state of disaster, or we were in a national state of disaster as a consequence of COVID-19. And Section 27.2N contains a provision which says that the Minister of COGTA may make regulations uh, concerning, and I'll read it, other steps that may be necessary to prevent an escalation or to alleviate, contain, and minimize the effects of the disaster. Now, if you accept, as I think you must, and as our courts have said, that COVID-19 produces a disaster under the Disaster Management Act, and if you accept, as again is the premise of, this, um, of, of my address, if you accept the premise that vaccines prevent the spread of COVID-19 and prevent the odds of serious illness and health, then it seems to me that a regulation which required vaccines would, would comfortably fall within 27.2N. And of course, you would have to draft it in a way that is reasonable and justifiable, taking into account all of the rights, including those that Nyoko spoke about. But from a virus point of view, you would certainly be able to craft that as being a 27 to N regulation, and that means that you could do it by means of regulation quite quickly, as opposed to relying um, 
on actual legislation being passed. So in summary, I think it is eminently arguable that government bears a duty to enact some form of legislative regime under Section 72 of the Constitution and uh, uh, in, in order to deal with this issue. I think there are many advantages to it rather than relying on the OHSA. And I think that government would have the power to do so had it wished to, uh, if it wishes to do so going forward. Thank you very much. Ali, you're on mute. Uh, thank you, Steve. Um, I think some extremely interesting uh, discussions uh, pertaining to um, the state's uh, responsibility. Uh, Adil, did you want to come in and, and respond to, to, to what has been said by Steve before we open up to questions? So I think just from, from my side, from an employment side, Steve certainly provides a neat solution uh, from an employment perspective, provided it's drafted uh, in, in such a manner as not to create further burden on the employer. But it certainly will assist in providing employers with better guidance as to how it's introduced, who it evaluates, what are the factors it takes into account. But most importantly, and I think of fundamental importance for employers, is what may it do insofar as an employee refuses to take the vaccine and it is not exempted. Because what we are going to have to defend at the CCMA or the Labour Court having been red flagged already these sort of cases is whether it was discriminatory to terminate an employee's employment solely on the basis of them refusing to take the vaccine. And if we, the first employer that's unsuccessful in defending such a claim, the costs are enormous. Having a legislative regime, as Stephen sets out for us, provides employers with the comfort and the guidance to deal with this pandemic and to assist the country at large to achieve uh, herd immunity. Thank you. Um, thank you, Adil. Um, I don't know if Niako, if you want to say anything in response, otherwise I'm going to ask some questions. So there is a question um, regarding how different is this from the HIV AIDS is, is the question posed. The difference is, the, and that goes to a consideration of, of the limitations, right? So the difference between this and HIV is the science of it. Um, one does not, for example, contract HIV by working together with somebody who's HIV positive. However, because of the science of how COVID-19 operates, one could contract, and that's why that um, just limitation is just or could be justified in the circumstances. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Um, Adil, I've just got a question. Uh, I'm going to read out a statement uh, basically from uh, what the minister has said uh, when the regulations were being passed, and also on. So what is critical is that we need to balance the needs and to take the dictates of collective bargaining and the need to keep employees healthy and business running. The LRA emphasizes the primacy of collective agreements. Deed guidelines are not intended as a substitute for collective agreements or agreed procedures between employers, the employer organization and unions. Should we not leave it to the parties to decide? Flexibility is important and realistic. And the ILO, look at the ILO's guidelines on on, on mandatory vaccination. Uh, they say a similar a similar thing. Uh, it requires cooperation between management and workers. Um, 
Uh, employers have the obligation that workplaces are safe. Consultation with workers in all aspects of, of occupational safety and healthy are essential elements for decision making. So basically what they're saying is that we don't necessarily want to create a nanny state. We don't want the state to be directing how, how this should be done. Should we not leave it to the employer and employees to say, let's negotiate and come to an agreement? Because while you're saying the obligation is on employers, the obligation also, also lies with employees. I'm not sure what your take on. I'm going to leave it to Steve. To all talk please, please. Yes, I'm going to leave it to Steve to talk to you about it from a, the, the state's responsibility. But certainly, I want to start off by piggybacking on what Steve says. You're sitting with a global pandemic. You want to create herd immunity, but yet you're saying that we can have different standards depending on which employer you are. So you could have three employers within a particular sector approaching this matter completely differently. Some saying we're not willing to take the risk of introducing a mandatory vaccination because we can't see ourselves defending, we can't see ourselves going through 120, 130 exemptions, getting a law degree within a week to determine constitutionally whether this is a medical ground, religious ground, dignity, physical or bodily integrity, employing loads of attorneys to determine this. That's outside of our core sphere of business. But the main problem for me apart from an employment perspective, is this division we're creating between the employed and the unemployed. The state needs to fit, needs to come to the party so that there is equality between all citizens as such. Thank you. Maybe, Ali, can I, can I come in there? Um, oh, sure. I, I think, um, I think Ardil's exactly right. Uh, but I think the real difficulty is this. In an employment environment, normally a debate about working conditions or a debate about remuneration or anything else is something that affects the, affects the employers and the employees, but it doesn't affect broader society directly in that way. And so to leave that to a collective bargaining process is, is, is one thing. But the debate about whether Mr. X working at company Y gets vaccinated and proceeds to infect Mr. Z is something that doesn't just affect that company or those employees, it affects society at large. And so I think that that is the reason why this issue is not really an employment issue in alone and, and, and why there may be a need for it. And, you know, it, it's worth saying, because I see there's a question on the chat and, and maybe I can just, just deal with it now. There's a question from, from, I think, Krista, who says, well, have we done enough to figure out why people are not taking up vaccines voluntarily? And, and I agree with that. I think the best way of doing it is to persuade people to do it, and I'm fully supportive of that. But the truth is that there is extraordinary misinformation out there and disinformation about vaccines. And if I'm skeptical that there, is, that there will be enough um, to, 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 to make that happen. Um, and in that context, this is not the first time the, the world has ever faced compulsory legislation about vaccines. There are cases from the US in the early 1900s, Jacobson versus Massachusetts, about compulsory smallpox vaccination, and um, Zucht versus King about uh, compulsory vaccination for children in schools, where the US Supreme Court upheld those compulsory laws. What this US Supreme Court will do with Joe Biden's vaccine mandate is a different question. But I think that, um, because the world has changed and the US Supreme Court has changed, but I think what it demonstrates is the idea that individual choice doesn't trump all when it comes to vaccines is not a new idea. It's not a knee-jerk response. It's an appropriate response in many contexts, and and, and I think in, in this context it is. And if I may, I don't know if Rose is going to go next. Or... I want to also piggyback off that to say that whatever the framework in existence, which Adil mentioned earlier in his presentation in chief, the directions and the legislation that is currently being used it is used in relation to a particular relationship. There is nothing that compels um, people who are not within that relationship to be vaccinated. And therein lies the problem right now. 
Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, Professor Kachalia, your hand is up. Thank you. Um, so let me try and spice things up a little bit. <laughs> I want to put forward uh, what, what many will consider a very controversial view. Uh, le let me start by saying that um, I agree very strongly with the argument. Um, when Mohammed first put it to me, I, I, I wasn't certain why the question was being put in this way. In other words, focused on the state's constitutional duty. But I am completely uh, convinced by Adil's uh, compelling arguments, uh, as, as well as, uh, as Stephen's uh, constitutional arguments, um, for uh, the state to, to take action uh, by passing a law of general application uh, to create legal certainty, to ensure that uh, there's equality in a, uh, in a sense, and to be able to fight a pandemic, which is, which is what we should not forget. Um, hundreds and thousands of people uh, across, uh, in our country and across the globe have died as a result of the transmission of this killer virus. Um, and governments have taken action, um, mostly informed by um, scientific evidence and advice. Um, <clears throat> We, we, we are not out of the woods. Uh, we, we face the real likelihood of a fourth wave. Um, so I want to ask this question. Whether uh, any restraint, any restraint on individual decision making crystallizes a question of constitutional rights. In the first place, now, uh, I, I understand that uh, that uh, if this matter comes before the Constitutional Court, whether that restraint has been placed by a, a private uh, employer, by an employer or by the state, constitutional question of uh, a limitation of rights could arise. Um, um, before the qu justification question arises, there's a prior, if you like, I'm asking a philosophical question, whether, whether any restraint in any circumstances immediately crystallizes a, uh, um, is, amounts to an invasion of a constitutionally protected right, uh, right to dignity, freedom of religion, and, and, and so forth. So the example I might put uh, is, is, is uh, the seatbelt example, right? We, we, that's a restraint on individual. It may be a trivial example, but we, we, we accept that the, that uh, um, such a restraint may be required uh, for reasons to protect other 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 drivers and so forth, reasons of road safety. Um, and we place all kinds of restrictions on on the drivers of motor vehicles to protect the public, to pro to 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 foster road safety and so forth. Um, a mandatory vaccination which does not coerce individuals to take the vaccine, does that amount to a, 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 a restraint on bodily integrity? Yes, I understand if you forcibly fed the vaccine, yes. Maybe that's, that's a, a, uh, that would amount to an invasion of bodily integrity. But if to protect uh, other employees, to protect the public, to protect other persons in a shared space, whether public or private, in order to save lives, does that immediately raise a question, a violation of rights question? And I re the reason that I'm I'm putting for for this point with some uh, vehemence, I suppose, is is that I I think as soon as we start to pose the uh, question in this way, it sort of it sort of limits the discussion. I mean, I for instance can't understand the argument. I'm generally in favor of religious exemptions. But why a person who's religious 
is in any better position than a person who's not to spread this killer virus. Why, why does the question even arise? Now, I know that, uh, you, you know, you know uh, this is an emotional issue and, and I, I think there should be negotiations and discussion and persuasion and so forth. Um, so I am simply, I'm, I'm raising the question, if this matter came before the Constitutional Court, I would certainly say before the justification analysis arises, the question would arise whether a mandatory requirement to take a vaccine in the context of a pandemic amounts to an invasion of any constitutional protected right. And certainly if it does, then I'm in agreement with Nyoko that uh, the, the threshold of justification would not be too difficult for, a for the government, provided it, it acts uh, you know, proportionally, uh, it would have to meet that, that test then, uh, that it would survive constitutional scrutiny. Um, I, I suppose I, I feel in general that sometimes the language of rights uh, obfuscates the questions before a society. We, we are now in a position where we think that every kind of complicated issue, uh, moral, political, and otherwise, requires a, a rights analysis. Uh, or a, uh, a, you know, let's assume we didn't have a constitution in place. Would the government have a duty to act in these circumstances in the common interest, in the context of a future pandemic? There are many countries in the world that don't have constitutions like ours. Of course we do, we're fortunate that we do. And, 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 and so it's inevitable, I suppose, that we will, we will in this society, structure the debate through uh, as a debate about rights and their limitations. So I'm, in brief, I, I, I think that not every constraint on individual decision making re crystallizes a question of rights. Secondly, I think that a mandatory uh, requirement, provided it satisfies the requirements of, of, of proportionality, would survive constitutional scrutiny. I would encourage employers to, to, to impose this requirement. Um, and it, it concerns me that there is so much confusion, so much uncertainty about the proper parameters of government power and responsibility in these circumstances. And, and, and so, so I think that uh, Stephen is absolutely right. I'm now convinced that um, following this uh, seminar, um, President Ramaphosa should be imposed upon uh, to to initiate such such legislation so that we all know uh, that we are required by morality, by law, by the constitution to vaccinate. Uh, and if we don't, we are acting uh, in a way that is irresponsible. Um, that's what I think. I'm sorry to be that controversial, but, Thank but you. let's see if there's a response. Thanks, Firoz. I see Steve's hand is up, uh, and then I'll, I'll put your question to the panel after. Well, I, I actually wanted to respond to Firoz, if I, if I may, Ali. Of course, that's what I'm... Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. You know, uh, Firoz, I think we reached the same conclusion, but I think we reach it on a different basis. And I think it might be important to articulate the difference in the basis, because I do think that anything that imposes mandatory vaccines is a limitation of fundamental rights. I think it's a limitation. I, I, I agree that religious freedom should not be singled out above all others. I agree that there are others, but I do think that um, if I am required by law to undergo any medical procedure, that is a limitation of my right to bodily integrity. I do think for the reasons I've articulated, it is um, justified. But I, I, I think we need to be a little bit careful. And that's the reason that I, in my premises, I tried to distinguish between two things. Assume that the vaccine was only good for me. It prevented me getting ill. It prevented me getting sick and dying but it made no difference to whether I transmitted it to Adil or, or Nyoko. Uh, 
I think in those circumstances, a mandatory vaccine policy would be unconstitutional because it would say it's a limitation of my rights and it's only to benefit me and I should be able to make that call for myself. But that's why I introduced the, sec the third premise, which I think was a loaded premise, but one that I understand is supported by the science, which is that the vaccine doesn't only benefit me, it also benefits Adil and Nyoko if I'm working with them, because it reduces the odds of me spreading a deadly virus to them or a virus in deadly form. So I, I agree with the destination you arrive at, Feroz, but I, I, I think I disagree with the route, because to me, it is a limitation. And, one, and in order to render it constitutional, one would need to actually show that it benefits not just the person who gets the vaccine, but those around him. So I, I think that might be the debate between us. A brief, re a brief response, if I may. Um, um, so, so like, I mean, this is the first time I think I'm taking senior counsel on, but that's that's OK. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, um, is not the question is is this is is the real issue not the one that you point put your finger on which is that the that this killer virus is transmissible now so so the the it's certainly the interests and the rights of others as well as society as a whole are immediately implicated um Let's look at the facts. In the United States, what has the, what has been the social impact of uh, vaccine skepticism? Um, Mr. Biden has done a great deal to try and uh, bring that virus under control, minimize the social and economic impact, which has been devastating. But but there are there is a sizable proportion of the population in the United States that believes that their rights are being violated by a government or by employers introducing mandatory vaccine requirements. That's the context. Um, so in, the, in societies where culturally, where there's a culturally embedded notion that these restraints automatically trigger a question of rights, um, there has been a huge cost, a social cost, in terms of lost lives, lost jobs, economic carnage. As a result of this idea, you pointed also to 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 so impact of misinformation, social media, and so forth. So I guess we back philosophically before we even reach the constitutional question to this uh, basic philosophical question about, on the one hand, individual interests. I think not all individual interests are protected by rights, and collective, common interests. And in the context of a pandemic, um, I think that um, the, the rights, the, the, the interests of society uh, prevail. Now, you're quite right. We can maybe, uh, we, we arrive at the same point, we're simply saying that, um, I mean, the reason that a mandatory restraint would survive constitutional scrutiny is because you're giving weight to some of the factors that uh, I am uh, articulating, uh, which would not otherwise um, uh, um, succeed under uh, Section 36, correct? In, uh, in other circumstances, the, the, the right, there would be a clear breach of the right. And, and uh, um, as you indicated, um, it um, uh, restraints which would, would be less likely to survive the Section 36 analysis. Why would a mandatory restraint in these circumstances more likely to succeed under Section 36? It's precisely because we're dealing with a pandemic. And that's also why we agree that the, the, the state has a duty in these circumstances, constitutional duty, to act. But in any event, I, I, I'm happy to, 
to, to rest on the conclusion that we both agree on that, that a mandatory requirement, which does not uh, coerce individuals, would survive uh, constitutional scrutiny, whether imposed by a, a private employer or, um, uh, or by, by the state. Uh, and so, Adil, I, I, I think um, the CCMA needs better legal advice. Okay, thank you. Uh, any response from Adil and Nyoko to, to this debate that's happening between Steve and... Uh, I think that just to give guidance to, to where we're going to while uh, the, this debate rages uh, within society as to who has the obligation. From an employment side, we are now going to be fighting uh, a host of cases uh, at the CCMA or at the Labour Court. And all we've done is in the interest of society as a whole. And if we don't get this right, the cost to the economy, the cost to employers are going to fundamentally increase. So there needs to be a mechanism if we agree at the end of this uh, session to at least urge government to take proactive and speedily uh, steps in order to pass some sort of legislation or have some sort of regulatory framework to give us some sort of guidance. Because, and I want to just add, and probably Stephen of the Rose and you know, then answer, because as an employer, especially in the service industries, if I go and have to service uh, another entity, they're informing me that my employees are unable to, to render services until such time as they are vaccinated. And I'm saying, they say, no, I'm prepared to render services, but they don't want me to. And the debate is whether I can retrench those employees or do I have to retain them but continue paying them despite the fact that they can't uh, render services because of the nature of the rule placed on me as a service provider commercial. And those are the debates we're grappling with. Those are the debates the employment uh, fraternity is grappling with uh, at the moment. Stephen? Nyoko, do you want to go? I know you wanted to make a point. Why don't you go first? No, I think my point was on a different question. You go. I'll wait. You know, um, Adil, the thing that makes me anxious and 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 it was alluded to in, in in one of the comments is this i want to be clear on what i'm saying i i am not saying the existing law doesn't allow for mandatory vaccination there was a question from i've lost the name of the of the question i apologize i think it was per I, i'm not saying that there is no law of general application that allows a company like discovery or somebody to insist on mandatory vaccination i think that the ohsa does that but what I'm saying is that it is an imperfect and inadequate solution for two reasons. Number one, it leaves it up to the discretion of the individual employee, employer whether to do so. If Discovery or Momentum or Cliff Decker or Vitz decides not to do it, there is no obligation to do so. And that's a major problem in my view. And it's a problem which is very much at odds, or it's a situation which is very much at odds with the Biden mandate, which requires all companies over 100 employees to vaccinate. So that's the first problem. But the second problem is that even if you were going to just leave it to the discretion of individual employee employers, I don't think it provides much helpful guidance on how to do it. And, and so for me, that's the real problem particularly where, as you, as you articulate, all organizations or employers come into contact with the public all the time. And so you can't pretend that they are hermetic, that the workplace is hermetically sealed from the public. 
So for me, and again, I want to be clear, if someone came to me for advice and said, can we as a company impose a mandatory vaccination policy under the OHSA? My answer would be yes. In fact, it, it has been yes. But for me, that's not the full extent of the question, because the question is, shouldn't there be a mandatory requirement that companies do it? And uh, shouldn't the companies be given greater guidance? I, sorry, if I may want to push the envelope a little bit and say to Stephen, sure, there, there is a law of general application, but within a particular context, though, and I think this is what we need to be reckoning with. Otherwise, we wouldn't be seeking to compel the state to intervene. We must all accept that definitely there is a law of general application, and you're right. The Occupational Health and Safety Act does do that, but there is no law of general application which requires Cliff Decker to require me as counsel to be vaccinated. I don't work for Cliff Decker. So de there is a gap. I think that's dead right. But I think just the question, and it comes out on the chat as well, so in the services industry, uh, you know, maybe just to, for you to answer this question, if I as an employer wish to go, in, go, eat, go to Wits University to service them or to consult, I'm not allowed to go there unless I provide them with my vaccination certificate. And the question then is whether VITS is entitled to insist that such a policy be implemented for its service providers. And I think that's the debate that's happening at the moment as well. So I think the answer is yes and no, and then we become somewhat of a circular because yes, that is a place of employment where persons are employed. But why, on what basis would VETS require me, who is not an employee of VETS? I accept that I'm coming to render services, but is that enough for VETS to seek to compel me, who is an unemployee? to be vaccinated. And that's precisely why Stephen keeps using the language of forcing a, a circle onto a square. There is a gap. There is nothing that compels me to heed to VETS's demands under this framework of the Occupational Health and Safety Act. You know, I'm really alarmed uh, because I'm only, I'm sort of beginning to understand the full extent of the problem uh, that employers are facing and 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 citizen general uncertain about about what their rights are in the circumstances employers i mean i i would uh, i don't know if stephen uh, and and yoko and Adil will be interested but certainly um out of this i've, I've never i see there's some suggestion in the chat uh, for if if some kind of statement from this um, webinar uh, was put together uh, calling on the government to act to address the 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 very the issues that uh, I, I think Adil was very clear about on on the employment side the uncertainties that are arising the equality issue um, the 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 strong constitutional arguments about justification that Nyoko put forward and Stephen on, on the duty of government to act constitutional duty. So let, let's be clear, I, I, I think that the best way forward, um, I know I had a little bit of a rant, but the best way forward in South Africa, um, given the constitutional framework, is for us to make strong constitutional and policy arguments for cert for the need for certainty and clarity on these issues and uh, you know i'd be very happy uh, for to support a a, um, a statement to that effect coming uh, coming out of this uh, webinar i think steve wants to respond uh, do you want to respond to that steve yeah if i can just as a last response because i think it goes to Adil's question directly and relates to uh, questions that are in the chat. I think Vitz or a restaurant or any workplace is entitled to say that the people visiting the place of work must be vaccinated because of Section 8 
of the OHSA because 8.1 says every employer shall provide and maintain as far as reasonably practicable, practicable a working environment that is safe and without risk to the health of his employees. And 8.2 then allows the taking um, of, of measures to do that. And I think Vitz is entitled to say, we have people who work here, and if Adil Patel wants to come and consult with the Deputy Vice-Chancellor, he must show that he's been vaccinated. And similarly, I think whatever your favorite restaurant is down the road, is entitled to say that before Feroz arrives to eat his steak, he must show that he's been vaccinated because of the employees who would otherwise be exposed to the virus. So I think the OHSA is broad enough, but it still seems to me for the reasons I've articulated that to see it only through a workplace view or a, an employee employment view is too narrow. But given that that's all we've got, if, 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 if you came to me and asked for advice on that, that would be the answer. Thank you, Steve. I think uh, if you look at the, at the chat, um, Beren McQuenna is putting a plea to the Mandela Institute, to uh, Mr. Kachalia. He says, uh, can you lead the compilation of recommendations to NEDLIC and government to urgently make a proclamation to keep the implementation of the mandatory vaccination in abeyance while the issues regarding the uh, the necessary legislation and constitutionality around it are clarified because if we leave things as they are in January, some companies will be dismissing people. Uh, and I think that's, that's something you spoke about again. Um, just to look at some of the questions maybe uh, at the in the chat. Uh, I think we've, uh, I think there's one. Okay, I think, I think Steve, you've answered the one by Deploy Marencha. She said, can you please elaborate why occupational health and safety cannot be relied upon for employers to also apply its mandatory vaccination policy? And I think you clarified that by saying it can be used, but we need a bit more direction from the state. Uh, yeah, I, I think you've answered most of the questions there. I, I think we... I think we have. There are some specific about yeah. whether or not the Poppy Act uh, would be violated with regard to personal information when it comes to vaccinations. I'm not sure if anybody wants to answer that one. I'm going to give Stephen the last chance to him and Feroz just to conclude uh, with their closing remarks. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks, thanks, Adil. I'm definitely not going to answer anything on the Poppy Act uh, if I can avoid it. Um, those are the opinions that terrify me. But um, just as a closing remark, th thanks very much, Ali and, and, and Adil. I, I think I think we need to bear in mind two things. For me, this is a it is an unprecedented situation, and we cannot treat it as business as usual. We need creative, progressive, and um, to some extent, inventive measures to make to, to deal with it. That's the one point I'd make. But the second point I'd make is we don't need to reinvent the wheel because, as I say, there is a well-worn jurisprudence in other countries around mandatory vaccinations. And, um, and so I think with appropriate thought and care, we can come up with government uh, policy and legislation that would resolve it. Um, and, and I just think it, it requires all of us to, to give it some thought. Um, it does depend on the various premises that I've articulated, but if you're not going to accept the premises, then you're not going to accept any vaccines in any event. So I think there's not much point in debating those premises further for, 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 pur for present purposes. Those of us who agree with them must, uh, must all contribute and, and find a way forward. But thank you, for, from my point of view, for a very illuminating and very helpful discussion. And uh, for Rose, I think the last word is yours. Um, I don't know if anyone has the last word on on this difficult uh, subject, um, but but you know from the presentations, isn't it clear, colleagues, that uh, from the employment law point of view, uh, employers uh, are well within their rights to uh, to require vaccination. Uh, employers like this, um, and that. Um, uh, if government uh, were to um, enact uh, legislation um, to require mandatory uh, vaccination, uh, provided it was properly uh, structured and, and tailored, 
um, it would probably survive uh, any constitutional uh, challenge. Um, I think it's very important uh, to encourage people uh, to vaccinate. I think the medical epidemiological evidence is 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 clear. Um, and uh, you know, I hope that the seminar has has contributed uh, in a small way to, uh, to 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 clarifying the legal as well as the the compelling moral reasons for us to to vaccinate. Uh, I also want to thank Ali for organizing uh, this event and uh, to all three of you who uh, who have been so um, articulate, uh, persuasive. Uh, thank you very much for your presentations. Thank you. OK. Um. Well, thank you, Phil. Um, I'd like to, to close the, the, the session. I think uh, first I'd like to thank the Mandela Institute. I think uh, in support of hosting such uh, webinars, I think it makes us think about issues a bit differently. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Iroz and, 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 and assistance from, from, from Akhta. So I'd like to thank Cliff Decker, uh, Karushka and her team uh, and, and, uh, for, for assisting as well. And the three speakers, um, Adil, Mioka, and, uh, and and Steve, uh, thank you very much. I think uh, you raise a very important question, uh, and I think uh, it's not just about labor. It's a bigger issue, uh, a South African issue in some sense, but a global issue. Uh, how are we going to be tackling the, uh, this, 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 this virus and, uh, and whether uh, mandatory vaccination should apply to all of us, I suppose. So I think it, it raises a number of questions. And uh, Firoza's suggestions of us taking it further to uh, to those who can implement it uh, is something that should be done. So thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you for attending. I think uh, time is uh, is limited, uh, especially to the end, end of the year. So thank you very much for, for taking your time uh, to spend it with us. Uh, we may not have answered all the questions and maybe we've raised more questions, but at least hopefully we've, we've, we've tried to look at things differently. So, so thank you very much. Uh, for, for spending the evening with us. Thank you, everyone. And keep safe and all the best over this festive season. And uh, take care.